Welcome to MicroCollege, a podcast exploring innovative, place-based, and humanly scaled responses to the crises in higher education, meaning, and discourse in our time. Everyone knows that colleges and universities are at a breaking point, but what can be done? I'm Jacob Hunt, the director of Thoreau College, a micro-college in Viroqua, Wisconsin. Join us each week as we tackle this question head on. Welcome to MicroCollege. This week on the podcast, we are excited to have the founder of the MC Richards program at Free Columbia, Nathaniel Williams, and also the director of the MC Richard Pro- Richards program, Stefan Ambrose. Welcome, Nathaniel and Stefan. Hey, Jacob. This is Stefan. Great to hear you. Yeah, uh, Nathaniel here. Thanks for inviting us, Jacob. Really glad to be with you today. Really excited to have you on. Um, The MC Richards program is a program that we at Thoreau College really see as a peer, a really important exemplar of the impulse that we are working with here in the micro-college world, and and also as an organization that's doing a really excellent job of of describing your your philosophy and your your approach to teaching and education. So really excited to to dig into what you're doing. Um, Before we dig into that, though, um, we'd like to to hear a bit about your your stories. Um, if you can think back to to where you were when you were 18 to, to 21 years old, where were you, what were you doing, and, and how does that connect with what you're doing today? Yeah, um, I, could, I could start with that. Um, so when I was 18, I had, um, I had kind of just come out of a pretty unconventional, a variety of educational experiences with homeschooling and public schools and um, and some private schools uh, patched in here and there, and um, I had I had made it through all of that. I was I was playing in a band as a musician in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, and that's a whole story in itself, which I'm going to pass over pretty quickly. In any case, towards the end of that chapter, I um I was reading. Uh, I was reading widely already, but I, I, I read through a book that just lit me up. Um, it was written by Rudolf Steiner called The Philosophy of Freedom. And I, I, I knew some people that were over in Europe uh, that were studying or yeah, yeah, learning over at the Goethe Anum, which is kind of one of the centers of the work that Rudolf Steiner inaugurated about 100 years ago. And I had some other connections in Europe, and so I... I just, uh, you know, I was young and um, and wanted to go over there and see what I ran into. I got a cheap ticket and and uh, flew over with a, a little bit of cash in my pocket and and was staying with friends. And when I stopped in um, in Switzerland, where the Goethe Anum is the center, I was just really intrigued with what I met there. And I ended up um, I ended up kind of coming across this new Studio Art School um, that was inspired by um, that that whole kind of area of work that came from Rudolf Steiner's initial um, efforts, and and I, I I ended up studying in this art school for for three years, and um, it was independent. It was it was quite small. I mean, you know, this is a, a micro college podcast. I think that in that Studio Art School we had. In my class, we had 12 students, and then there were a couple other years that were working parallel. It was pretty much run by two really gifted, exceptional artists um, who are also really spiritually and intellectually, um, I guess, intriguing and deep and thoughtful. Who were aware? Who were who were very interested in very, um, yeah, I guess what would mostly be called just taboo spiritual questions, um, but also so interested in contemporary intellectual life. So it was um, it was a very fertile place for a young individual to um, go find themselves, uh, you know, working with. Um, living with questions, which I had a lot of questions at that time. And yeah. I can say without a doubt uh, that, that that experience of being in a small school like that with a totally independent um, faculty that really, in the end, the buck stops, 
talked with them, which meant they, they felt responsible for everything that happened and whether it was good or not. You know, they couldn't kind of um, shove responsibility onto any administrative system or any governmental requirements or anything. And um, they were doing it. They weren't accredited in any way, <laughs> you know. Um, it, it, I, I think I probably owe more to them than I'm even aware of. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's, as we've asked this question to several people over the last couple of months, the 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 individual connections with with mentor or teacher figures is something that comes out really regularly. That that's coming out strongly here as well. Um, and another thing that strikes me from that story is it sounds like you you found a context that that really um, mirrors what you've created at MC Richards as well, and that there's a, a rich combination of intellectual, philosophical, spiritual um, impulses and ideas and conversation going on along with the arts? Yeah, I mean, basically my, my primary competence is definitely in the arts. It was a wonderful, um, kind of intensive learning opportunity there where I, I was able to, you know, develop the basics of an artistic approach to practices like visual art, but also more more generally um do a number of things i ended up working a lot with performance art after that and i know i built on that foundation and my secondary you know uh specialty is in um social sciences which i have you know an advanced degree in but yeah i i would say without a doubt the the artistic foundation um is just inv invaluable um and and what we've uh what we've been able to do as modest as it is here you know um yeah i that's definitely true excellent thank you nathaniel so what about you stefan what where where were you during that period in your life <laughs> yeah i guess to speak about my young adulthood I, I have to say a little something about my childhood i uh so i'm actually from florida i grew up in the green swamp region of florida which is Absolutely not what most people think of when they think of Florida. There's no strip malls. <laughs> there's, uh, there's just actually about nothing there. Uh, that's changing now a bit. But when I grew up, it was just a vast marsh and swamp. There was nothing. And I was raised in a very rustic way, pretty much myself and my brother running around, you know, with our with our guns or our bows, doing pretty much whatever we wanted. And so when we hit school uh, from the time I was five until I was about 18, that became a pretty interesting and confusing world. Um, you know, materialism, as is taught in the normal course of schooling, was just something I wasn't so familiar with. Uh, I was raised Southern Baptist, and so I had a very strong religious upbringing, and I lived very strongly with these questions of how to square my deep love of the land that I grew up in, my religious upbringing, and then the, the emerging world that was emerging for me of materialism and of of uh, community culture and of um, in Florida, like the intense gentrification that I would see um, into my 20s of that of that land. And so <clears throat> I finished school and pretty soon I moved into my first religious community. That was where I wanted to seek those answers. So I, I lived in a Sufi community for about a year. And then I uh, moved on to living in a Vedic context where I really just became a student of philosophy. I was really, really intrigued by what was coming out of these ancient cultures and trying to understand how can this be relevant to the world that I am coming to know in the modern context, but also this incredibly, incredibly rich world of natural phenomena that I grew up in. I don't know if, um, if you're familiar with the Vedas or with the Upanishads, but this is a scripture that is absolutely teeming and alive with not just the spiritual, but the natural world. Mm. And I wanted to understand how can I connect the natural world to the spiritual world that I, I felt like I had this, this rich connection with. So I lived there, there for a number of years and eventually came into contact with uh, two individuals who would be really important for me in my life, um, also mentors, David Wolf and Marie Glasheen. They run a, a small school called the Sotbatov Institute for Transformational Coaching. And they blended a mix of uh, Rogerian dialogue and empathic communication with the knowledge that they had received through the Vedic culture. They're both initiates in a, in a branch of Vaishnavism. And I spent several years studying with them uh, these 
methods of empathic dialogue, um, conflict resolution, community culture, and that was really the first window that I had into what would eventually I would know as phenomenology. Mm-hmm. What does it mean when you sit in front of a person and you open yourself to receive them fully? So not to abstract who they might be from you know, the color of their skin or the clothes they wear or the beliefs that it seems like they hold based on, you know, the words and the language they use, but to really just allow all of this to wash over you and to make a space for them to reveal themselves within you. And so that went on into my mid to late 20s. And around then, I was also running a business and um, decided that, you know, it just wasn't this wasn't the kind of life I wanted to live anymore, and um, especially learning about cooperative culture and what alternative business practices. I felt like actually the business I was running was um, somewhat extractive and maybe unhealthy for the employees that I that I had, and so I, I ended that, and I actually moved to Europe, to England, to Emerson College, where I met the work of Rudolf Steiner. Um, I learned about phenomenology and anthroposophy, and uh, that really is how I got to where I am now. And um, and I guess in reflection on that, what I found in phenomenology was a kind of completion of my questions around how to bring traditional spiritual values, this incredible world of phenomena that we live in, in the world together. How, how can we bring these things together so that there's a sense of integrity in our, in my worldview. Yeah. And, uh, so that was that's kind of what I was going through in my young life, uh, really intense searching, questioning, um, doing my best to to bring a balance between maintaining you know uh, my body and my finances and um, and really cooking, boiling in these questions that I think so many young people are are living with today. Micro College is recorded in the broadcast studios of WDRT Viroqua, 91.9 FM, Driftless Community Radio, on Main Street in Viroqua, Wisconsin. Thanks to Jim and all the folks at WDRT for the support of Thoreau College and the Micro College podcast. Wow, that, that's a lot of strands to follow there in that story, Stefan. Um, one thing that, that does stand out from, from both of your stories is the role of, of sort of spiritual seeking. Um, in, and I think we, we here at Thoreau College really see it as that is an important feature of, of this age. Um, and I think you know, part of the impulse that, that, that lives here and I, I, I think also lives at, at MC Richards is a sense that, uh, you know, it's important for for people in their young adult phase to, to encounter to be in a place where these questions can be entertained in in a in a really open way. Um, many institutions, structures in our society asks us to to separate rigidly uh, spiritual from from the rest of life in some way, right? That's that's you know that's that's those are the private function is basically questions of of meaning and purpose and spirit, um, and or to enter a place where at, that makes you. Ask you to commit uh, to a particular interpretation of reality, to a particular creed or faith. Um, I'm wondering if you have thoughts, you know, from your experiences and also from from the the, the several years of, of MC Richards. Um, how how can you create a space where 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 that balance can be can be met? That actually is open to those questions, to the to, to the really intensive seeking that you're describing, while also you know being being an open place that's that's not that's not rigid in its interpretation when people come in. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, you got, I can tell, you know, you've done a lot of thinking about this, Jacob, from how you framed that question. I'm sure that at Thoreau College, you've also practically, you know, navigated a lot of that, um, a kind of dynamic. I mean, you're right. I mean, one of the things that I think it takes courage, and it's absolutely necessary, in my view today, to, to take a closer look at, is how we're we're unconsciously perpetuating um, a uh, a kind of yeah a view on things that has about you know you can trace it back pretty clearly 400 years ago in the transatlantic civilization right um, particularly Europe but then what came over to the United States and you know when you point out that we're used to looking at spiritual questions as a private matter, you know, that has all of its history, and it's very interesting, also very important, I think, to understand 
but um, I think that, uh, you know, this is something that I, I really deeply feel it's time also to to challenge, you know, not through, not to disprove anything that's being put forward, um, particularly um, as a result of, like, scientific inquiry, um, but to entertain questions that really have been taboo and that are taboo still in almost all colleges and universities in the United States. Um, you know, and, and to be... Nathaniel, can we use that word taboo? Could you, us, could you give a sense of what you mean? Yeah, I just mean like things that you're not allowed to talk about. You know, sex, for instance, is something that is taboo in some circles um, and definitely was more so in the past. You know, the last hundred years has seen that change somewhat. And when I say taboo, I'm talking about speaking about spiritual questions in the way that you're now indicating. Um, you know, um, do you see, like, can we seriously entertain the possibility of coming to understand something of how the spiritual is not just psychological um, comfort or, you know, a, an ideology, um, but actually is a integral part of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, can we can we can we broach that conversation in a way that's not dogmatic? And um, I think that, you know, there's a lot of ways to do that. And I don't, you know, so that's the first thing, you know, to recognize that already creates a space of openness. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we're, the, in founding the MC Richards program, you know, I named it after MC Richards, who was a um, teacher at Black Mountain College, who ended up becoming, you know, one of the probably most famous American anthroposophists of the last century through her writing and her ceramics work. And, um, you know, this is the, the kind of approach that uh, we can offer because of also who we are, I think. And it is, you know, it, 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 it opens up questions about whether or not, for instance, you know, at various ways of paying attention, even experiences that we might usually disregard to ideas that we usually might not even entertain, you know, mm -hmm. to open spaces where that, that can take place. Um, and to really, I think that one of the ways to keep the mood really open is to always focus as much as possible on describing experiences and also trying to maintain a kind of mood of intellectual modesty. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and, um, but then to be very clear in the intention, you know, William James at the end of his life, a lot of people don't know that besides prag pragmatism, you know, he wanted more than anything at the end of his life for empiricism to expand towards the spiritual, you know, and that was a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't read, um, his, uh, some of his late lectures, just, there's a series called The Pluralistic Universe, which is really a touching intellectual spiritual biography of this profound person. And, um, and uh, I feel directly spoken to by him, you know, when he, he throws down the gauntlet there. Um, and um, we're, in our modest way, you know, trying to be part of that discourse and those efforts as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, before we get too far along here, I, I would like you to, yeah, could you just describe the MC Richards program for us? If, you, if you're, as all of our listeners pretty much will be hearing of it for the first time, what is it? And, uh, and yeah, what, what, what is the kind of scope of this program? Right. Okay. Yeah, that's a good, that's a very good question um, to kind of give a frame to the whole conversation. I mean, we, we created um, a full-time uh, program for, you know, geared towards uh, young adults, college age adults, um, and the there's there's basically what it looks like is um, there's a, a group of teachers, and each year it's been a different number of teachers, and teaching a very diverse field of um, subjects. So you know we have um, we definitely have a lot of arts from performing arts. Um, visual art, uh, sculpture, uh, but we also have social sciences, economics, make appearances, the natural sciences, the basics of physics, um, optics, uh, biology,
morphology, introductions to morphology, um, and yeah, and uh, they're, they're, the students work very intensively with one instructor usually for, well, until this year, we've changed it a bit this year, which I can, we can say a little bit more about in a moment. But um, they're, they're pretty much, you know, be able to meet uh, someone who's, who's developed a really sincere, deep relationship with a capacity or, you know, a field of inquiry. Um, but in a particular way, I mean, all of our teachers, uh, you know, the science teachers, for instance, we, we really look for them to have a background in that stream of phenomenology that actually goes back to Goethe, which, you know, most people, phenomenology is referred to, you know, they think of Heidegger or Melo ponty or um, Husserl, um, but um, there's another stream, a kind of epistemic community that goes back to Goethe, and we have some brilliant natural scientists in our area that have been part of the program from the Nature Institute. And so students work with, uh, you know, them for many hours over a few weeks um, every day. Um, and then in the afternoons, uh, you know, there'll be practical arts, often land care, um, gardening, um, learning a lot of just very basic uh, capacities um, with, with some kind of an instructor or facilitator. Um, we also have had, you know, leather work, um, woodworking, um, ceramics. Um, so, you know, the, the year is quite engaged. It's very intense. Um, and we've just made a turn and um, we're, we have now actually less things happening in, a, in, in the interest of being able to develop a really solid capacity through the year. And we're starting with ceramics. Mm -hmm. So now... Um, as of this year, um, we've kind of put one practical art in the center of the whole year, uh, which is ceramics and uh, wood-fired ceramics, um, which I'm sure will come up uh, with Stefan, um, <laughs> who's directing this year. I'm sorry, I'm still in his thunder a little bit here. No, this is great. It's it's great to hear the genesis <clears throat> of these ideas and you know where this comes from, because it's also partly how I came into this stream is through Nathaniel, through the Nature Institute. Um, they've been incredible mentors, colleagues, and friends through the years. So, right, and you um, were, you're one of the original students of the program itself, right, Stefan? Yes, exactly, exactly. So I've been studying with the Nature Institute for several years and completely, um, you know, fell head over heels in love with Gertrude Science and Phenomenology. And, you know, I've already said a little bit about that, felt like this was really the answer uh, to all the questions of my early 20s. And um, so I, I, you know, it was a little difficult for me to decide to do the course because I was I was a little older. I was 20, uh, 29, 30 when I decided to do the course. <clears throat> and I went for it anyway, and I'm so thankful I did because even at a later age, the benefit to a course like this being about direct experience is it doesn't matter how old you are mm -hmm. or what stage of your life you're in. I mean, I think that we could have a student come to our course who was 50 years old, and you would still get so much out of it because it's about the phenomena. It's about what's in front of you and your relationship to it. So ideally, we're building this meta skill or this, um, this muscle, this inner capacity that is active throughout our whole lives. Um, so in any case, I did the course, and I taught last year, and then this year, uh, the opportunity arose for me to have a greater role in directing the course. And the question I was living with from my experience in the course was, how can we bring Gertian science, phenomenology, this spiritual questioning into relationship with the hands, with the world of craft, so that we can still sit in a classroom, we can still be with instructors in Gertian science, full-time training, but how do we bring that work every single day into the workshop? And what we noticed with a lot of younger students is they really, they really needed something to put their hands on. They needed to apply these skills every day and, and to engage their will. So we were already doing some crafts and we decided, okay, well, let's expand on this because it seems like every time we get into craft work, students are happy they're getting a lot. You can see them coming into relationship with the phenomena and talking about it later. 
you know, would be sitting at a meal and they'll start sharing about their leather work or their ceramic work. And this felt like a good thing. So we increased this by um, reaching out to a local film monitor in our village who just happens to be a 20 year veteran of ceramic arts and has been firing wood kilns for 20 years, which is a huge boon. This is not something that you necessarily you know, find around the corner every day. And this is an incredibly phenomena rich practice. I mean, when you have a, a brick kiln, if you can imagine something that's about 10, 10 foot by five foot with about a 17 foot chimney, 2200 degrees, and you're maintaining that atmosphere with wood that you have also cut and bucked and barked and split into little tiny, you know, very slender pieces about an inch by two inches. Um, with, I mean, that is that is a really intense phenomena to experience. And so the impulse this year is to bring the Gertian science and the phenomenology into the stream of craft work so that's something that we're always, always practicing. And and that it it's something that whether you're, you know, 20, 29, 30 years old and the age I was and I felt like I had really developed a, a, a disciplined life or you're an 18 year old person that kind of needs maybe something a little more hands-on in front of you to practice these skills so we can do that together. Yeah. Uh, so that's more of the direction the course is going this year. We still, all of the same principles that were in the course before are still here. And I think that's the amazing thing about a principle is that it's flexible. So we can apply these principles to anything we do and this year to make a start, in particular uh, wood-fired ceramics. Yeah. So we're speaking to you here in, in late August. I understand this. The, you're beginning this week with the, the third year of the, of the program. Is that right? That's right. We actually we had our opening circle yesterday and our uh, our first kind of real day of class today. Cool. And how many students do you have this year? And, and, and who are they? Where are they coming from? Who's who's drawn to doing a program like this? So th this year we have four students that have already arrived to class. We have one other student in Mexico that's waiting on a visa. And these are, these are young adults between 18 and 25. Uh, they're coming from a wide range of backgrounds. Uh, we do have uh, three of our students have strong um, histories in the, the Waldorf education movement. So these are people that are in general, and, and then one person that's very involved in, in dance and, for instance, the work of uh, Gabriel Roth and Contact Improv. So these are people that are interested in the arts. They have deep and real questions about life, and they want a they want a laboratory, and that's really what we are. This is a this is a workshop. It's a laboratory for people to bring their questions and to live them, and that's the the answer I would have given earlier to uh, the question you asked Nathaniel about how do we maintain these open spaces where people can engage with spiritual questions on a daily basis. And for me, it's it, in a way it's very simple, just to live our questions. And that's something we really, really encourage here is to live your question. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I guess w one of the things I, I wanted to spend some time on, as I mentioned, I really think that you, you've done a great job on your website and, and in your materials and laying out the idea that lies behind this program. And, you know, it can be focused on ceramics or have the variety of things that have happened in the past. But there's some really core principles that, that you've articulated clearly. And I'd, I'd like to get you both of you to, to talk about these ideas. Um, the first one you list in your principles and practices is contemplative inquiry and contemplative pedagogy. What does that mean and what does that look like on the ground? Yeah, um, so, you know, there. The, the term, I mean, I can't take credit, you know, the, the term has its own context and meaning um, outside of our, you know, the way we use it, but it's, uh, that's why we use it. But um, Arthur Zients, who um, I think is probably the the individual who has had the most influence on it, the way it's understood, wrote a book probably 15 years ago on um, meditation as a path of knowledge. And, um, you know, we're used to thinking about contemplative practice or meditation as something that um, is related to health and well-being or spiritual um just personal spiritual ennoblement, um, which I think all of those parts of the contemplative life are obviously meaningful. Um, and uh, Arthur Zients, you know, he poses a question, of course, in the lineage of um, Rudolf Steiner's work 
of whether or not through um, attention practices and also feel practices with um, contemplative feeling approaches with feeling life and also with the will, we can uh, kind of circling back to what I said about William James, that we can approach in inner experiences, but more in the spirit of that they might reveal something about existence. Um, so an inquiry, a, a mode of inquiry, you know, mm -hmm. contemplative inquiry, and how that looks. You know, we don't um, we don't uh, you know ask uh, the students to to engage in practices as part of the classes necessarily um, that. Uh, you know, are very difficult or, you know, it's not like a, a school for meditation. Right. We I mean, do... people, people might be familiar with, with places like Naropa University. Are there, there, there are institutions right. that incorporate meditation into like every class session or into, into a basic kind of rhythm of, of a day or a class session. Is, is, that, is that what we're talking about here or something else? No, I think there is a slight difference. And, you know, the medita uh, contemplative pedagogy um, is often used... Um, I think it is related, but it's also slightly different in that, you know, contemplative pedagogy and Arthur Zions also was very involved in that whole, the development of that movement as we know it today nationally in the United States in colleges. Um, um, it can be used as a way to become centered, attentive, open, um, but it, it's also something, I guess the question that we pose in, with contemplative inquiry is whether or not one can also become sensitive to spiritual facets of things other than ourselves. You know, spiritual dimensions to, say, plant life or to um, uh, a material like clay or to wood that we might be working with. And to take that seriously, not just, um, and, and to kind of foster an attention, a, a kind of attention that could take that seriously, that would be going in the direction of contemplative inquiry. The Driftless Folk School, located in the beautiful rolling hills and valleys of southwest Wisconsin, is a community of lifelong learners dedicated to cultivating personal and cultural resilience through hands-on educational experiences. The Driftless Folk School offers classes in agriculture, land stewardship, natural history, folk arts and crafts, herbalism, wilderness skills, and more. For further information on the Driftless Folk School, visit us at driftlessfolkschool.org on the World Wide Web. Another term, you know, one of your principles and practices, um, I think it, it's come out somewhat in what you've talked about already, but I'd love to, to hear your definition of it, is aesthetic education. What do you mean by that? Well, I can start on this, and I know Stefan um, has also a deep relationship to this, but... Um, Aesthetic education, you know, I think conventionally we think about it as artistic education, and there are good reasons for that. Um, and the way that we use it, though, it is the education of the senses, and that is not only the task of arts. Now, arts are very fruitful grounds for developing the differentiated possibility of the eye and the heart in the eye or, you know, the ear, but... You know, observing careful observation of the metamorphosis of a peony, that's also aesthetic education. I mean, and not only that, um, it, it's not so prone to be uh, an education of the senses and feeling that directs you back to yourself, mm -hmm. but it kind of ties you into the outer world, um, which, and the greater world, you know, it kind of takes you beyond yourself, but through your senses, and your feeling, and aesthetic aesthetic comes from the Greek, which is uh, indicates knowledge through perception, and um, so we use the term aesthetic education as the overall cultivation of our uh, perceptual judgment in art and uh, also in, in science. Stephen? Yeah. So in the study, for instance, the study of a plant, will we um, go sit and just observe a plant in many different conditions day by day. Let's say we, let's say we pick the tulip poplar tree in our front yard and we, we go and we visit it every day 
whether that's for five or for 30 minutes. And eventually maybe we decide to draw the tree, maybe in color, but maybe also in black and white, focusing on the shadows, on the different, the different shades. Maybe we sculpt the tree. Maybe, maybe we do pressings of the leaves in series. And what's really interesting is each one of these things on its own teaches, gives a lot. But when all of these things are seen, experienced in series, in the synoptic display of what it means for this to be a tulip poplar tree and for us to be in a relationship with it, something can really begin to speak in you. We, we go and we're in front of the tree practicing thought resensing where we really try to still quiet the mind, let go of our abstractions of even what a tree is. What is this, what is this being, this shape, this color? What is this in front of me? And through the space we make in ourselves, something might begin to speak back at us. We might begin to know something a little more uh, rich and, and deep about this beingness of the tulip poplar tree. And that's exactly the kind of process that Goethe went through when he was developing morphology and working with, um, with plants in his Italian journey, which was a kind of historic event in, uh, in our form of science. So um, that's, uh, that's a little bit about what I think about aesthetic education. Also, when Nathaniel mentioned the work with clay, it's really interesting to involve the will in that process because we're observing the clay, we're feeling it, we're smelling it, we're touching it, we're molding it. And at the same time, the clay is also working on us. I mean, I don't know if you've ever um, done a craft and you, you have a dream mm. about your medium. You start having dreams about clay. <laughs> and you really start to speak in the language of clay, your hands do. And that's something you can only get from making these sorts of inner space through practice so that something can really become a part of you. Hey, right down on the level of language, you can see that that uh, you know, an engagement with, with the senses and with the material world in the way that you're describing it, it enriches our way of, of, of thinking and, and speaking about the world. And I think your MC Richards, you know, in her writing is, is a beautiful example of that. I mean, her, her classic task is called centering, which is about centering in a spiritual, you know, personal sense, as well as in pottery on the potter's wheel, as well as in poetry, right? There are ways that the, these terms, which are, which are very physical, can be also, you know, they, they inform the way that we are able to, to understand ourselves. Yeah, I know. I was just wishing I had more of her words on my tongue because, Lord, she, she, she just, she, she lights it up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think um, it's it's been observed. You know, our our time is one that is is very uh, attuned to quantities of things, right? We we need to count it, measure it, weigh it. Um, but uh, what's missing in that often is is an attention to qualities, right? And that requires a distinctive education, right? Um, yeah, so that that's that 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 term aesthetic education has always resonated with me in reading your materials. So um, another term that 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 comes up and I think is manifested in your curriculum is the idea of action research. Can you talk a bit about, about how that's played out and what, what you mean by that? Well, um, I can say that that is an area that I feel like, I, you know, it's, it could grow a lot. And, you know, basically, you know, action research, it has a lot of uh, ways that it's presented also in conventional academic approaches. Um, and the way that I, I um, you know, in founding the program, I was thinking about it was basically challenging uh, a learning space that we were trying to create to come up with ideas and that required us to do things. And where we could only find out if they were good by doing them, <laughs> you know. So you can't find out about if they're good if you don't try them. And um, you have to judge the, um, you know, their value, actually based on implementing them, and that's of course a deep economic, political, community lifestyle challenge. And we have made um, some humble starts at that. One of them was a local economic research project where we were looking at the possibility of designing a currency with a number of social kind of inspirations that could, yeah, I guess in, in, in different ways um, enliven and um, encourage, uh, I guess, better, you know, some, some good directions for our county. 
Um, and um, we've done a couple, uh, you know, projects in that direction that would, would, would require actually an action, even on a community level, um, and then judging, you know, how, you know, its value by the fruits. And I think that basically having that as a challenge and trying to find projects that, that require collaborative initiatives and then reflecting on whether or not what you've done is good. Um, that's a real school of life thing. Yeah. So the research piece, you know, comes from that reflection, right? There's action and that's then there's right. reflection. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And in addition to what Nathaniel said, something that's really exciting to me is how the MC Richards program itself is an act of action research where every year we come together with our best ideas and we, we test and see how we did. You know, what's going on? What are the students saying? How are they living? Um, I have students contact me years after uh, the program that I was in and now one year after last year's program that we taught and they're still, they're still giving us information. They're still communicating to us what they've received and we're still taking that into account and doing the best we can to create an experience that is truly in integrity, coming from our beliefs, coming from our direct experiences, coming from uh, from what we've created. Yeah. So that's that's a deeper, maybe a deeper way that that principle is at work in in our community. Yeah, one of the things that 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 I think of when I see that term action research also that that you alluded to you know, both of you was engagement with your local context right which is another one of your your core principles living in con you know learning in context there so maybe could you say a bit more about your your community and you know, like like Thoreau College you're located in a, in a rural area small small community what what's it like and and how does how does free Columbia um, MC Richards program fit into that context well, we live in a, um, you know, it's a really interesting village. It's called Philmont, um, named after Miss, Mr. Phillips, I believe it goes back to, who is the industrialist that harnessed the water that falls 200, 250 feet down the hill here and leased um, pools for factories to be set up, um, driven by water power in the early Industrial Revolution in this part of New York. And um, there was a boom. Um, the Civil War was a big time for this town. I think there were some contracts for long underwear for the Union soldiers. And let me tell you, there's some good sidewalks from that time period still around. Um, but, you know, like a lot of America, you know, um, the industrial foundation of the village um, is no more. And um, so, you know, it's a town with, with good, solid bones and very interesting history. And also, um, you know, uh, it, it's like a lot of places. There's like there's a sense that something something needs to happen, you know, to to become like a sustainable and also something that can give hope for you know the future of, of the village. There's a lot of wonderful agriculture, um, sustainable agriculture, small farms in the area. And we're right in the middle of town. I mean, we are really like a couple, houses down from the post office um, and we've been here for many years and um, and really the people here have been graciously welcoming tolerant you know we do things like play with big puppets sometimes which is <laughs> always suspect um, and and um, yeah I definitely feel like you know I can walk down the street and I just see all kinds of people I know you know it's a population of around 1, 1,200 people and, um, you know, we just started a service project today at the public library where we're painting their tool shed during the first week. And um, while I'm saying this, I'm just going to, you know, accessibility is another one of our, our ideals. And yeah. our context is also we need to make what we do accessible to our context. We don't own, it's not only a question of making what we do accessible for people to come to our context. But what we do, we want to radiate into our context in a way that it's accessible, not to force it on anyone, but to look for opportunities for collaboration, for sharing. If we create artworks or performances, to share it as freely and widely as possible. Accessibility isn't only a paywall with tuition. 
It's about overcoming all the ideas about bubbles mm -hmm. for colleges. You know, <laughs> like yeah. we need learning communities. I know Thoreau College probably y'all have a similar situation and opportunity the way you're situated in Baroqua. Thoreau College is a leader in an emergent movement dedicated to the renewal and revitalization of higher education through the creation of new, humanly scaled institutions with holistic curricula known as micro-colleges. Thoreau College, higher education for the whole human being. Yeah, I think that, that that's, for me, an important reason for this micro-college idea, right? That if you have a, a micro-scale institution, it really has to be integrated with the community. The bubble is, is it just is not 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 tenable, and, and that means that that you know engagement with the local community is is inherent, um, and 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 really an enriching part of the curriculum. Um, I guess if my dream would be if we had these micro-colleges of this scale in every town, or you know, really in I every know. county of the country, right? Yeah, now you're talking. <laughs> So one, one impulse to add to that this year with the ceramics program is to build a – so we built this kiln last year. We started in, in the middle of January. If you can imagine a uh, upstate New York winter, um, you can also imagine some very dedicated students. And uh, so we built this kiln, and we just had our first firing several weeks ago. And it was, a, it was really an incredible experience. I mean, you run this kiln 24 hours a day for four days. Three days really hot. Fourth day you're you're kind of working with it. Then you let it sleep for three days. But while we're firing, and there's always two people on shift, you saw that a huge amount of the people from the village just kind of ambled, you know, ambled up to the house, and we weren't at the house, and they ambled up the hill, and they saw us at the kiln, and everyone was, just, oh my gosh, what's going on back here? And this is really about making things accessible and available where. We're bringing industry, I mean, this is a very small industry, it's very humble, but we're bringing something of the nature of craft and production back into the village mm -hmm. where people can feel proud of that. So we had a, I can think there's one, um, one young father who is a musician and he, he's not necessarily very um, like craft oriented or handy or anything like that, but at one point we're feeding the kiln and it's pretty intense, you open the door and there's kind of flame shooting out and it's a kind of romantic and dramatic process. And he was looking over in, in a really interested way. You could tell he really wanted to know what was going on. And he's not involved at all with our initiative. So at some point, I went over to him and said, hey, would you like, you know, throw some wood in the kiln? So for the next several hours, here's this guy, doesn't know anything about what's going on, has never made a piece of ceramics, and he's feeding the kiln for a couple hours. And he says at the end of it, hey, I, you know, I really want to come by and I'd like to make something to go in the next kiln run. Cool. <laughs> and hopefully that work is not work that's going to go just into uh, into a gallery or somebody's studio, but this is work that's going to go into people's homes. Uh, we're finding local initiatives in our village and in the next uh, the next city over where we can get our work into people's homes and initiatives where, you know, when people pull, pull out a cup or, uh, or a platter for an event, it's, it's things that were made in Philmont. And, and I think that people in a, in a place like ours can really start to take pride in something like that. Yeah. I'm, I'm chuckling a little bit here because I'm looking at our producer here, Liam, Liam McGilligan, who is a recent Thoreau College student and also a potter, um, who made a very serious pitch this year that we should build a wood-fired kiln right in town <laughs> here in Brooke as part of Thoreau College. So you're, you're adding fuel to the fire there um, that's already burning here a little bit. <laughs> I'm sure MC Richards is behind all of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, Nathaniel, you mentioned um, the the concept of of uh, free culture, of no paywall for culture. Um, that also is an inspiring part of of both MC Richards' program and also the the Free Columbia. It's, uh, itself, which is, goes back before these recent two years. Um, so maybe you could, could you both tell a little bit of the story of, of Free Columbia and also how, how you approach money in this, in your work? Yeah, um, this is, you know, I, I mean, I guess to, to start off, um, this is something that I just feel like a lot of us know, um, and it's become particularly burning issue, I think, for young people today, because through the divestment movement related to climate change and the fossil fuel industry. But we know that our whole way of working with money, something's wrong. Something's wrong. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and um, 
and I don't think it's an easy answer. And I, I you know, I, 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 um, I think that there's, uh, there's a lot of, of, of action research and thinking that needs to go into it, but there's a lot of good work that's been done. And, um, you know, one of the big ideals that we had was we wanted to bring together independence and accessibility through free culture. Independence is usually something we associate with private schools. Mm -hmm. They're not accessible. So we didn't want that. Um, accessibility is usually something we um, associate with public schools. They're accessible but not independent. So we set out to try to frame what our, our um, financial needs were, constantly have them visible, communicate them to all of the students, all of the family members of the students that would listen, <laughs> yeah. and all of our you know people who are, uh, want to support what we're doing um, you know over the last 14, 15 years, and to really run it a little bit like public radio. You know, public radio has it easier because of what they're doing. They're putting out what's called a non-rivalrous, uh, uh, you know, you listen to the radio wave and someone else can listen to it too. It's not something that one person can have, you know. But um, the model's great. It's public. It, everyone can tune in, but um, it's carried by the donations of the community. You know, and there's a feeling of ownership and local independence in a lot of uh, public radio stations in the past. I know today yeah. many of them might not feel like that anymore. Well, but I, I feel like I, I just, since context, you're bringing that up, I just wanted to mention we are recording this today in our local community radio station here, WDRT in Viroqua, um, which is an independent community radio, which functions exactly as you're describing, right? Supported by the community. There you go. And you know, so we're I, we're we're not paying anything to use the studio here. We're putting this out over the airwaves, um, but it's supported by the community through through all the ways that that public radio was in, in the past, but but really directly by the volunteer work and by the financial donations of the community. So it works, and we're here, like, experiencing at this moment. <laughs> yeah, great. So, yeah, living uh, how apropos. And uh, so basically the, the what we've learned is the most important thing is to make realistic budgets, um, to communicate the actual expenses of things, and to help people determine like how to come to terms with a contribution. It's not like a free donation where you just put a basket out, you know? Mm -hmm. That doesn't work. You have, we, we make judgments and context. We have to know what it takes, you know? So we have sliding scales and suggested contributions, but they always go to zero. They always go to zero. And that's related to tuition and to material costs. Mm -hmm. And um, I firmly believe that there is enough wealth in the United States if it was being directed more by the community conscience and less by um, the speculative spirit of the gold rush, <laughs> which we find at, you know, on the stock market, at, for example, we could do this. <laughs> you know? I mean, we have done it for 15 years in a, on a tiny scale, you know, but Another thing that we, we bake into that is you can't run it on volunteers. You have to pay people. Mm -hmm. So even if somebody wants to donate a class, an instructor, for instance, we pay them and we ask them then to make the contribution back to us. Mm -hmm. um, and um, now we don't pay like some big schools, you know, but we try to get up there with, you know, what you know, an, an adjunct at least what an adjunct faculty would be receiving at a at a university. Yeah, as as a person who's worked my whole life in nonprofits, um, I, I I've really taken that to heart, um, and really, I've really valued your your language about that, Nathaniel, in the past. You know that we, uh, these these community organizations doing good work in the community can also really consume people, um, and and recognizing the value of that service is 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 important, and supporting you know the people who are doing it in, in any way possible is is really essential part of a value to, to be maintained that I really appreciate the way that you underline that. Yeah. So how, you know, in, in practice, so you've, you, um, the, 
do you say what proportion of your expenses are covered by by your students and and what is coming from I know you do crowdfunding you do other sorts of activities there how does that work out in practice where does the balance lie yeah um, so the the ba so the the full-time programs are almost always subsidized by you know they're not covered by um, Tuition and I each year it would be a different percentage of tuition contributions to cover what we do. Um, however, like when we run short classes, um, often we'll bring in more than the expenses for those short classes. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, we move money around. Um, a lot of the the money we raise through crowdfunding and through our appeal will definitely go to support our full time offerings, which are the heaviest lift that we have financially in Free Columbia, which is the not-for-profit that hosts the MC Richards program. Um, yeah, and I don't think that has to be the case. I think that the MC Richards program could be sustainable almost entirely on tuition contributions, but we would need two to three times as many students. Mm -hmm. um, but even then, year to year, um, depending on the makeup, you know, we get a pretty diverse group of students that come. And depending on their backgrounds or socioeconomic, you know, um, means, you know, uh, you, you just gotta you gotta have enough to make it through the year. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Awesome. So uh, we're we're coming up close to the end of our time here. Um, I, I wondered, you know, I know that you're in transition there, um, Nathaniel. You've been been the founder of. One of the co-founders of Free Columbia and, and and the founder of the MC Richards program, you're in transition out. You're off to a new position on a, on a global level at the Gutianum in Switzerland um, as the director of the youth section. Um, and you know, yeah, I wonder if you could talk about about that that work. What 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 um, what what are you looking forward to in in, in that position? Yeah, um, you know, I. I have to say, um, first of all, that my heart and my mind are so um, turned towards what we're doing here still, even still when I'm leaving in about four months, I'm, I'm really excited about what's, what's happening, what Stefan is bringing in his collaboration with other teachers from the past years. And I'm like, I'm, I'm not, I, Stefan's really leading everything. I'm just a teacher at this point, but I'm also playing like um, back catch, you know, anything that needs to happen. And so, um, that's hindering my ability to answer your question because <laughs> I, you know, I know that what is coming towards me is going to be a very interesting work, and um, you know, the the Goethe Anum as a, a a place which um, you know I'll be working there as one of the directors of one of the sections. I feel it has a super important position today in um, being being really a place of courage. To discuss some of the things that came up over this hour, you know, and um, and not only that, but also action research in all of the vocational fields. You know, when you think about the Waldorf School movement, the biodynamic movement, those are all examples of attempts at radical renewal based on um, contemplative inquiry to continue with that, you know, phrase that we spoke about earlier. And um, so. I know that a lot of what I do is going to be connected to who I meet, the young people I meet, and it's a network of young people from all over the world, and we're going to have our first gathering a little less than a year now at the Goethe Anum. People are going to come together, and it's there that I'm going to have my ear tuned for what we might get into together and what are the living questions and also maybe challenges that uh, young folks are bringing with them, you know. I mean, recently I've been spending a lot of time thinking about the culture of um, you know, psychedelics in relationship to spirituality that I knew certainly as a young person and has been through various phases of popularity since the 60s. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's an important area to like spend some real time <laughs> working on. Also, you know, I know that there are young people that have serious questions, sometimes existential, related to those things. I think of technology, social justice, the um, the world situation. But I don't want to presume, you know. Okay. I, I think that uh, fire has to meet fire, and I'm looking forward to who I meet. 
Yeah. Well, I'm excited to hear what you, you learned too. Um, turning to you, Stefan. So I know we're just in day two here of your, of the new, of the new year. Um, but do you have any insights about what, what lies ahead for the MC Richards program? Um, I guess one question I had is you've, you've, you've built this, this kiln. Is it, do you foresee it being, um, increasingly focused on ceramics or is that, is that something just a characteristic of this year? So I see this as the first, as the first step forward in, you know, what could be, who knows, the next 10, 15 years of what's going on here. Certainly ceramics will, will stay, uh, remain at the core of what we're doing, but, but maybe that core expands. Uh, if we were, had enough students and we wanted to incorporate uh, a woodworking, intensive woodworking program or an intensive traditional crafts uh, section, or we have an incredible, one of my other um, deep passions is storytelling and, and how the imagination can be expanded and molded and, and brought out of ourselves through, um, through linguistic arts. We have an incredible storytelling teacher and uh, acting teacher here, John McManus. And if we had the funding and we had the students, could we have a full-time um, program? in storytelling and theater. And how then would the, at the intersection of the ima imagination, craft and Gertian science, what would come out of that? I'm just, I'm so curious. And for myself, I, I feel totally dedicated to, to living that question. And so um, asking will the ceramics program continue? Absolutely, the kiln is gonna be fired uh, at least every three months for the next who knows how many years. Um, we're already looking at and have the opportunity to build um, a larger uh, kiln, maybe even larger than an anagama, which is a traditional Japanese kiln that, that's about 30 foot long. It has the ability to really, I mean, with that, we can really do production work. And so what does it look like to have an initiative like ours that can also be really producing good stuff for the community that we can feel proud about and the students it then elevates what we're doing from, um, well, just a phrase that often plays through my mind is that I want to transcend cute. You know, I, <laughs> I, love, I love folk schools. I love, um, I love alternative schooling. I love micro college as, a, as, a, as an ideal. I, you know, I've had the opportunity now later in my life to experience a lot of really incredible institutions um, that are wrapping around these ideas. But I, I want to take this really seriously. And I, I want our students to really have the experience. If we're saying we're doing ceramics, like come and like let's let's make ceramics and let's put them out into the community. This isn't we're not just going to have fun. I mean, we are going to have fun, but that's not all we're going to do. Um, we're going to have fun. We're going to learn, and we're going to we're going to leave uh, we're going to leave something to this community. And um, so that's I mean, I could really honestly I could talk about this for a really long time uh, and also all of the other along with MC Richards and Rudolf Steiner and uh, Goethe and Soetsu Yanagi, all of the other people that I'm really inspired by when it comes to these traditions. Um, but just to say, yeah, I'm really excited about the future. I'm really, really excited about this year to see what comes out of it. As I mentioned, we really hold this initiative as a form of action research and I expect to be really pleasantly surprised by what comes out of this year and what the students are able to achieve and what our learning community will become because it's not just that I'm the director and the students are the students and the, uh, the other teachers and, and additional faculty are what they are, it's that we are one learning community and we're learning together what we will become and what we'll produce together. Each year it's really different, each year um, it's really a surprise in the end of what comes out. I think you probably know about that from your own initiative, and um, I guess I'll have to tell you that story in a year from now. <laughs> All right, we'll hold you to that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nathaniel. Thank you so much, Stefan. Um, folks who are interested in the MC Richards program, check out the show notes. And, uh, yeah, thank you. Have a good day. Jacob, thank you for... First of all, just hosting this podcast and inviting all the, the educators and initiatives that you have to be part of it. I really appreciate your work. Thank you, Liam. Yeah, thank you all.